Hello, um, I'm Judy Krasna. I'm the executive director of FEAST, and I'd like to welcome you to this month's webinar. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. Please keep your microphone off and your camera off throughout the duration of the webinar. Um, and if you have questions that you would like to ask, you can just put them in the chat box. And at the end of the webinar, we will leave time for questions to be answered. Um, and now I would like to introduce this month's speaker. For over 40 years, Dr. Kripe's academic and clinical activities focused on adolescent medicine. As a board certified pediatrician and adolescent medicine specialist at the University of Rochester, he applied the biopsychosocial, bio sorry, that was a big word, approach to all of his academic and clinical work. Having ended his clinical practice of adolescent and young adult medicine in June 2017 and fully retiring at the end of 2019, as Professor Emeritus, Dr. Kripe continues to focus on the education and training of future generations of healthcare providers in interprofessional practice related to the improving the health of adolescents and young adults, including collaborating with former patients now recovered from serious health conditions that they experienced as children or adolescents as they share their stories of what helped and what hindered their recovery. And I'd like to add my own personal short story of how I met Dr. Kripe. Um, it was years ago at the International Conference on Eating Disorders. I don't even remember what year or where it was, um, but he was part of a plenary panel and he spoke about how parents don't cause eating disorders. And he was just so emphatic about it. And, you know, it's a statement that a lot of providers aren't willing to make in a room full of other providers. You know, they dance around it, they probably believe it, but they're not going to come right out and say it. And he did. And he said it really well. And I remember he told a story about a father who came over to him and said, I feel like I caused my child's eating disorder. And he answered the father and he said, you give yourself too much power and too much credit. And I, I, that story, it just really stuck with me. And afterwards, I went over to him and I introduced myself, which is really not me. Um, I don't do things like that, but I was just so moved by his presentation and what a champion for parents and families he was. And so I went over and I introduced myself as a parent from Israel and a parent advocate. And I told him how much I appreciated in the name of all parents, what a champion he was for us and our involvement in treatment. And he said to me, he said, can I give you a hug? Which was such an unusual response. And I said, of course. And it was just such a moment of connection. And it was really such a moment of warmth. And I really wanted to bring Dr. Kripe here to us to feast. So you can all experience how wonderful he is too. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Dr. Kripe and he can get started. Thank you, Judy. Uh, let's see if we can pull up the screen here. Do the share and get the slides. So I, I really appreciate you to your kind words. And, and I guess what I really want to come to is the fact that I feel I was really lucky because I trained in an institution where we weren't really famous for treating patients with anorexia nervosa. Um, and I just want to kind of go through the stories of things that I've learned from patients and parents and others. But I definitely want to leave enough time to be able to, you know, kind of have people be able to ask questions, make observations, et cetera. So I really appreciate the opportunity to talk today. So I think a lot of people think of Rochester as, you know, the far north, it's the tundra. Uh, this is a, a, a shot of the uh, picture of the University of Rochester campus. Uh, you can see in the lower center, that's the uh, Interfaith Chapel. That's what I was, I was married there uh, several, years, several years ago. And then we see a little river, that's the uh, Genesee River, the only river that actually flows north, uh, east of the Rockies. And then we see a little bit of the town um, and then off to the distance is uh, Lake Ontario. But I have no uh, conflict of interest in, 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 in this presentation. So the learning objectives, what do I wanna make sure we get across today? First of all, <clears throat> I would really like to frame restrictive anorexia nervosa as a developmental rather than a mental illness with features that are related to adolescent development gone awry. Now, that's not to say that things like anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsiveness, uh, traits, such a compulsive traits and or trauma. Um, it's not that they're not present, they're associated, but I don't think they should be the defining features that deserve attention. Uh, that, so that it's not exclusive, it's that not the exclusive of focus. Um, and actually what I have always focused on is building on strengths and positive attributes of the patient and the family rather than what's wrong with them. 
So again, everything I'm going to say here is true. I'm not smart, smart enough to make these things up. A tale of two cities. So Jan, February, uh, J June 22nd, uh, 1979, I'm the chief resident at uh, St. Christopher's Hospital for Children. I'm on chief resident rounds in the afternoon. And there's a 14-year-old patient, female, who's in a single room with the door closed uh, with anorexia nervosa, but she was on the GI service, was admitted for GI testing. And I was told I couldn't go in there. And I said, why not? Well, she has anorexia nervosa. And I actually put my hand on the doorknob and the res one of the residents said, oh, you can't go in there. And I said, why not? I kind of backed off. And she said, well, anorexia nervosa. And I said, well, is that contagious? Uh, honest to God, that's what I said. Is that contagious? I've never heard of it. In four years of medical school, three years of residency, and one year of chief residency. And I was told, no, it's a psychiatric illness. Uh, I wasn't allowed to enter the room because the patient is there. These patients are manipulative and they lie. Uh, the mother is over-involved and intrusive. The father is under-involved and emotionally distant. And all she's here for is to have the GI service check to make sure there's not something wrong with her gut because she gets feeling full after eating a small amount of food. And I said, okay, well, that's it. I'll never see this patient again. But two weeks later, I'm a first year adolescent medicine fellow up in Rochester, New York, about 350 miles away from Philadelphia. Um, and I'm on the pediatric service uh, as an adolescent medicine fellow. Uh, but there was a patient who was actually admitted on the pediatric service with anorexia nervosa, a 15 year old girl. And I learned to, I came to this with kind of a curiosity. So I'm saying, I don't understand what is going on. So I tried to read what I could, but also really wanted to get the words from the patients. And so what this patient told me was, you know, I feel fat. And what I was taught about the difference between symptoms and signs. Symptoms are the, are the things that the patient reports feeling. Uh, symptoms just are. And so she said she felt fat. And I said, yeah, okay, yes, you feel fat. And I have my hand above my head. Uh, but also in, in examining you, your body is unhealthy. And those are the signs that I'm seeing. And so my hands at, above my head and about my waist. And I said, and between my hands is where your anorexia nervosa lives. And I have to tell you, this is the first I've heard of it. And I really don't understand it. But also I want to emphasize that those two things are not mutually exclusive. Subjective symptoms and objective signs are in different domains and they're all real. I think that was an important lesson I learned in taking care of this patient. Because at the same time, um, a, a group in Philadelphia, I was in St. Christopher's Hospital for Children in Philadelphia, uh, right across the town, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Salvador Mnuchin and other, other folks had a, uh, a wonderful program at the Child Guidance Clinic, and they wrote a book called Psychosomatic Families, Anorexia Nervosa in Context. And the thing that I was learning at this point was that in psychosomatic families with anorexia nervosa, the problem is that the individuals in the family have poorly formed identities, that there are boundaries between individuals are crossed, blurred, or non-existent, so that the, 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 the people get involved in each other's business that is not healthy. There's enmeshed relationships, so the families are all interactive or are in, in, embedded with each and in, in, entwined with each other in ways that are not helpful. The patient, again, was manipulative, deceitful, and causes splitting. The mother is overprotective and controlling. The father's emotionally distant and uninvolved. They have conflict avoidant interactions in the family, triangulated alliances and power struggles, homeostatic provided balances provided by the, by the illness. And what really struck me was just a few years later, Gordon Harper, also at the University of in, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, talked about this in the Journal of the American Academy of Child Psychiatry, varieties of parenting failure in anorexia nervosa, protection and parentectomy revisited. So, you know, ectomy means removal of. So you have an adenoidectomy to remove your adenoids. But a parentectomy, it told me that, wait, so you're saying the parents are the cause of the problem? And I think the dominant theme back in the late 70s and early 80s was, yes, these, these kids are this way because these kids are this way and these parents are that way. And because I came kind of as a blank slate, I said, wait a minute, what if it's the other way around? What if it's the way these kids and families are is because of the eating disorder, not the eating disorder happens because of the way they are. And of course, because I was only a pediatrician, people said, well, you don't understand. You have to be a psychiatrist. And I said, well, but I think I understand kids and families pretty well because I did get some pretty good training in child and adolescent development. So let's just ask the question, maybe it's not these symptoms, these, these traits cause the eating disorder, 
but these 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 things are the result of having an eating disorder. And so I was really lucky to come to the University of Rochester. I wanted to come to the University of Rochester because of the home of the biopsychosocial model uh, shown here. Uh, and this is George Engel. A, uh, actually, people often think that George Engel is a psychiatrist. George Engel was an internist who came to be in the Department of Psychiatry. Uh, so he is well trained in you know, biological mechanisms. Uh, but the thing I really like about the biopsychosocial model, I had a medical student once who said, you know, the first six letters of the word biopsychosocial spell biopsy. And I think a very important element of seeing patients in, with a, a restrictive anorexia nervosa especially, which can have significant medical complications, you really have to be well grounded in, in the biology of what happens with starvation and the kinds of habits that individuals get into. Um, and so I was really lucky to actually, George Engel uh, wrote this article in 1980 um, this is a picture from him. He did an article in 1977, 79. He wrote several articles. Uh, this was a picture from 1980. Um, and I, I really was lucky to actually train uh, with George Engel still being very active. He died in the late 1990s, but it was wonderful to be able to see him. And I think the key point here is that you see between these various levels, uh, the arrows go both ways. And so uh, biopsychosocial model was a very important thing for the way I would approach as a pediatrician, adolescent medicine specialist, learning about families and individuals. So there's two person, family, et cetera. You see how those elements all go together. But I was also very lucky, John Kabat-Zinn, uh, who again, I think most people think is a psychologist. Uh, he has a PhD, but it's actually his PhD is in molecular genetics. Uh, he was at, uh, uh, at uh, uh, MIT uh, getting his uh, molecular genetics uh, degree. Um, and, but he also found things about mindfulness. And I, I really found mindfulness to be a very important element of the way I try to, uh, when I work with patients. And what are the key points about mindfulness in the practice of medicine? Um, well, John Kabat-Zinn said that it's about paying attention in a particular way. And that particular way includes on purpose, that is with intention. So when I'm with a patient, I really wanna pay attention to the patient. I want to I want to I want to really focus my attention uh, with you know with intention of of understanding where the patient uh, is coming from. Also in the present moment, the now. Uh, I think a lot of time when we get very busy, we think about the past or the future. And one of the problems for many patients is they spend most of their time in the past or the future. And this is also true for parents. You know what they did wrong, worrying about what's going to happen in the future. And the whole point of mindfulness is. You're only in the present. The only time we have is now. So on purpose, paying attention with the patient, with on purpose with my, my intention, but also in the present moment now. Another thing that I think is really important with respect to mindfulness is that with curiosity, the so-called beginner's mind. So Thich Nhat Hanh as a, was a, um, he died just a few months ago. Um, he's a Vietnamese uh, uh, monk uh, who talks about Every time you see a new person, you come in with a beginner's mind. Um, and that was the thing that was very important for me. So I got to learn intensely what was going on for a patient who has anorexia nervosa, but I would always treat a patient who came in with a diagnosis with curiosity as if, well, what if they didn't have anorexia nervosa? What if they had something else? So I wanted to treat them uh, with a beginner's mind, so with curiosity. The other thing that's very important in mindfulness is without judgment. Um, so I'm just noticing. I'm not trying to judge things. I'm just being aware and noticing. And I think so when you really kind of pay attention in a mindful kind of a way, I think it sets you up to interact with patients and parents in a different, in a different, in a different mindset. And actually, we're really fortunate to have in the University of Rochester a thing called mindful practice in medicine. So actually for five years, I was the, I was the uh, pediatric faculty member to be doing mindful practice, teaching medical students, residents, et cetera. Um, and I'm still involved in the mindful practice in medicine uh, uh, program here uh, in which we really kind of incorporate mindfulness into be, being a better healthcare provider. And my main goal now is because I work very closely with the School of Nursing, I would like to change that to mindful practice, not just in medicine, but mindful practice in healthcare. Um, so I think that there, the physicians don't have the, uh, don't have the market cornered on this. So uh, that's something I'm going to be working on by my colleagues at the uh, University of Rochester. They're, they're based in family medicine, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm good friends with all of them. And the other thing I think is also important is this was a drawing that 
Chris Lyons was actually a resident with us, a pediatric and internal medicine resident with us. And he was, you know, kind of torn between being a physician uh, and being a medical illustrator. So I think he really, I had to ask him if he could, you know, draw a picture on the right-hand side is patients with anorexia nervosa and on the left-hand side, what it looks like with bulimia nervosa. And we see that there are many more features of, you know, health problems that go along with the uh, anorexia nervosa, the starvation, uh, than with bulimia nervosa. I think the problem is though, that because there's so many more medical problems associated with anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa, I think we underestimate the importance of recognizing bulimia nervosa, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, atypical eating disorders, that they have, they can have just as many problems. So the fact that the person with anorexia nervosa is one who looks sicker, doesn't mean that the other kind of eating disorders don't also have significant uh, health problems associated with them. And I think that's an important, that's an important thing to, to, uh, uh, to recognize. And I've had patients say, you know, when I had restrictive anorexia nervosa and my weight was very low, I got all this attention. When I developed bulimia nervosa and about 50% of patients will go through a phase where they start to overeat and I quotes look normal, people don't pay attention to me. So I think it's very important to not, not base, you know, the attention to a patient based on what they look like. Uh, but the key point about the anorexia nervosa, which I'd really like to focus on because that is the one that has the highest mortality rate, the highest comorbidity rates, it affects every system. Um, so that the brain and peripheral nerves, the skin and hair, the heart and blood vessels, uh, in the blood, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, the platelets, all, all of those are affected. The liver is affected. It, with the GI tract, motility and absorption, like the patient who was admitted to the hospital when I was a resident. Uh, the endocrine, which is based on the hypothalamus in the central part of the brain. The thyroid, growth hormone, adrenal gland, the gonads, muscles and bones. So it basically affects everything. And I think this is a really important element to recognize. And I know that when I first came to Rochester in 1979, the concept was, well, we have to deal with all of these. We have to deal with all the psychosocial issues. Why are the girls depressed? Why are the girls, de why she's anxious? Why she's obsessive compulsive? We deal with those first and then she'll eat. And we now realize that it's absolutely the opposite way of doing things. They need to eat to feed their brain. Um, and uh, so I think we really now recognize anorexia nervosa, especially very much framed as a brain disorder. Uh, all these other elements are important as well, but I think we, if we can't restore the brain, which requires uh, a good nutrition, uh, the other stuff just doesn't happen. And this is the thing that kind of, wait, where's this coming from? Well, in 1983, the, the uh, science was actually looking at, in, the, in, the, in, in, your, in our diet, there were carcinogens, things that cause cancer, and also things that would prevent cancer. Um, and I just found this really interesting, eat, die. So there are things that you eat and you prevent cancer. And on the right, there are things that you eat and you die because they cause cancer. And I just like this picture because I used to show this to patients because imagine what it's like, imagining that if you eat, you're going to die. And that I think is the dilemma for many patients with restrictive anorexia nervosa. If I eat, I'm going to die because I'll get fat, I will do whatever, lots of different kind of complications associated with it. So I really found this, this kind of this, this, this jarring thing that if uh, trying to help understand what a patient feels, uh, if you feel like you're going to die, if you eat, uh, that's a real dilemma. But the, where this really came home to me, this is a drawing of a 14 year old girl. Um, and just take a look at it. Just kind of look at the various things that you see. And so this was actually drawn by a 14 year old girl, Sherry. Um, and she had to do something for a school art project. So this is what she produced for a school art project. And I think the things that were really telling for me is the books, exercise, five minute exercise, secrets of staying thin, calories do count, recipes, dieting, and the jump rope, and the jump rope was there, not double dutch, that jump rope was there to burn calories like a boxer uh, training for a, for a match. The clock, she said, it's always dinner time. Uh, that's, the, that's the meal I always have to think about because I can avoid breakfast by just saying to my mom and dad, oh, I'll eat when I get to school. And then when she gets to school and it's lunchtime, she said, oh, I had a big breakfast. Uh, but when it comes to dinner time, that's the hardest one to get away without eating. Uh, so she always worries about that dinner time when the family's sitting around the meal and she needs to eat and she doesn't want to eat. The forbidden foods beyond arm's reach, the cookies, cakes, candy, candy pie, hot pie, ice cream, those kinds of things. And then within reach, the plate has no meat, there's no fat, there's uneaten peas, the strawberry, carrot, 
and you can see the fork is overturned, uh, you know, the evidence that she's done with her meal. Uh, but the key elements here really drawn to the middle of this is externally, she felt like a superwoman, but internally she was an empty skeleton. And I said, you know, on the left side of your face, it's kind of superwoman on the right side of your body. What is that? And she says, well, because I'm always feeling everything is different and nothing makes sense. And I'm always upset about various kinds of things. But I really found this to be a very powerful message for a 14 year old girl to kind of tell me what it was like uh, to have anorexia nervosa. And then the next element, this was a patient uh, who was in the hospital on a treatment protocol. Uh, she was obviously very creative. Uh, this was a, uh, what, as she called a voodoo doll uh, that she made of me. And you can see on the right side, there's pink heads, black heads, coated tongue, itchy skin, chapped hand, spare tire, flat chest, tired blood, lumpy arms, uh, aged spots, split nails. Um, and on the back side, stiff neck, curved spine, slip disc. Of course, you had to get hemorrhoids in there as well, boils, lumpy skin. But the thing that I found most interesting is Dr. Creepy. Um, so my name is pronounced Creepy, uh, but because it looks like K-R, it's spelled K-R-I-P-E-I-P-E, -E, um, most of my patients call me Dr. Creepy. And I would say, it's okay, you can think of me as Dr. Creepy because I'm gonna tell you you need to do things that you don't wanna do, but that's okay as long as you realize I'm doing what I, what I think you need to do to get healthy. You don't have to like it, but that's why I'm here. And so that was my Dr. Creepy doll. Um, and she was quite creative and it was actually interesting. The day she was discharged from the hospital, this thing was actually, she had a, kind of a noose around its neck um, hanging from a, 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 the door to her room. Uh, kind of telling me she didn't really like. You can also see there's pins in there. That's the voodoo doll. They said, this is when I had to gain, you know, five pounds. This is when I gained 10 pounds. And I can tell you this woman is now about 60 years of age. She's married, um, has a son who is uh, now engaged to be married uh, in his 20s. And uh, she's, doing, she's doing very well. But another patient I also want to talk about, I think it's important to understand it from the patient's perspective. This was Jessica who wrote last night, I ordered a small diet Pepsi to drink. Instead, I was getting a regular Pepsi. I drank half of it and then realized that I feel huge. And this was, you may not recognize this, but this was done, this was back in the days when faxes were fairly new and the paper was very kind of shiny. Uh, and why is this girl having a fax machine at home? Uh, her father was a surgeon. Uh, so she used his fax machine to send it to me. Uh, so she, 14 year old Jessica, she ordered a diet Pepsi at a restaurant, but she was given regular Pepsi. And of course she drank half of it and then realized it was not diet and I felt huge. And she faxed me this note the following morning before going to her private school. Um, this was Jessica at age 14. And here is Jessica at age 30. Uh, she lives out in Denver now. This is with her husband and newborn son. Um, so she completely recovered from that pretty serious restrictive anorexia nervosa. Uh, still has anxiety, yes. Still has, gets depressed, yes. Uh, still has some uh, obsessive compulsive traits, yes. Uh, but she focuses those uh, as a teacher. Uh, she's a, a, a high school teacher and she focuses them on what she teaches. Um, and so I think it's really important to always have realized that, that there is hope uh, for, for the future. And so one of the things that I've really tried to kind of focus on is that we need to talk especially about normal adolescent growth and development, which is an important element in the emergence of restrictive anorexia nervosa. Are there people who have, who have anorexia nervosa who didn't develop their anorexia nervosa until they're adults? Yes. But if you ask the vast majority of those individuals who are identified as adults, their symptoms started when they were still children or adolescents. Uh, so I think this is an important element to keep in mind. So what are the, the, the developmental uh, things that happen in, in adolescent growth and development? Well, go through puberty, girl to woman, boy to man, identity, child to adult, autonomy, childhood to adulthood, and then brain maturation. We now know that brain maturation things are happening early on. There's the reactive limbic system, which is kind of the central part of the brain to the proactive frontal and prefrontal dominance. Uh, that's all part of normal adolescent growth and development. And what I find so fascinating, the person who I talked to at 14 years of age who was struck with anorexia nervosa, and the person I talked to at 24 years of age who has, who's recovered from anorexia nervosa, actually looks back and says, you know, I, was, I, I realized that what I was thinking back then wasn't 
I wasn't thinking straight, but it was the way I was thinking because my brain hadn't matured. And so I think it's really important to talk about normal growth and development and restrictive anorexia nervosa. The reason it emerges in primarily in adolescence um, and, and, and there's research that suggests why it may be more true in adolescent females than males. Um, there's a re interesting research talking about the gender, the gender difference there. Um, is that we have to realize there's something to do with adolescent growth and development that's very important for the vast majority of patients, not exclusively, but the vast majority of patients. So I just want to get to some patient observations. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions and uh, uh, questions and uh, you know uh, observations. So Steve Levenkron is a fairly well-known um, uh, therapist, psychotherapist. Um, he wrote a book called the, the Best Little Girl in the World that was made into a movie. Um, and he, he had a, 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 a uh, I was at a conference where he presented, there was a patient, an adult patient in a psychiatric unit who noted to him when he came to visit, because he was a social worker, he wasn't a psychiatrist or a psychologist. And as a social worker, he couldn't admit patients to the psychiatric unit, but he went to visit her because they were in the same town. Um, and he went to visit her and she asked how she was doing. And what she noted to him is, you act differently towards me than my treatment team. No one here believes me. And I hear that from a lot of patients. And his response I thought was really important. I like to use this when I talk to patients, when I teach patients. And what Steve Levenkron said was, I reserve the right to believe you even when you are lying to me. And the reason I think it's really important to do that is to, you're not gonna sit in judgment. I remember I was at a conference a few years ago where a, uh, I was expecting a very famous uh, person who works in eating disorder field, especially working on the medical problems associated with eating disorders. I was expecting him to present, but it was one of his associates presented. And he just presented the various kinds of cases. And one of the things he talked about was a patient who had abnormalities in her electrolytes of the potassium and sodium were out of balance and, and uh, the acid level was out of balance. And he said that you know the, the uh, uh, conclusion was that because of the way they, the, the blood studies, studies, what they showed is that um, he asked her, uh, was she throwing up? And she said, no. And his conclusion was that she was lying. And at the end of the presentation, he was a, he was a younger, he was a still a train, he was still in training. I got up to say, you know, I think it's really important to when you come to the conclusion that a patient is throwing up because you have the blood levels and things that clearly indicate that, that she's been vomiting, um, that the conclusion is not that she's lying. The conclusion is that she's not ready to tell you the truth yet because she's not ready to tell herself the truth yet. Um, and, you know, I thought that was an important thing to say to him because there were a lot of people in the audience who were pretty uh, young and impressionable. And uh, I think to say the patient is lying, I think there's a different spin, the patient is lying to me versus the, uh, the patient's not yet ready to tell the truth. So again, I reserve the right to believe you even when you're lying to me. And then 14 year old Molly, this was, a, she was uh, forced to eat uh, and her entire prescribed breakfast. And the story, um, you know, I was telling Joan, Judy and others folks they, um, the, uh, the story of, uh, I would have therapeutic breakfast with patients every morning. Um, so I'm eating breakfast, she's eating breakfast, but she's obviously eating a lot more than I do because she needed 4,000 calories a day. Um, and so she was kind of, we were just kind of shooting the breeze, talking about various kinds of things. But she had, and I'd push, pushed the uh, a, uh, English muffin and two, two, two little tubs of peanut butter uh, off to one side. Um, uh, she said, I'm done. I said, well, no, you're not quite done. Uh, you still need to eat the, the uh, English muffin and the peanut butter. And she says, no, I don't want it. And I said, well, you're going to get it. Uh, the dietitian says this is what you need. You've been, you've been improving your health. You're feeling better. Your blood pressure, pulse temperature, all those things are getting better. You're getting stronger. You need to continue that, that path. Um, and so I brought the English muffin and the two things of peanut butter over. And I started, you know, I said, so you can you know, put the peanut butter on or I can do it for you. And so she picked up the knife and she very begrudgingly took the peanut butter uh, from one of the cups and put half on the one side of the 
English muffin, one on the other side of the English muffin, uh, and then she starts to eat it. And I said, you know, you need to eat that other peanut butter cup. And she said, no, 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 I don't need to. And I said, well, yeah, you do. Uh, that's why I'm having breakfast with you. Um, and she, she said, no, I'm done. And so I leaned across, being Dr. Creepy, I leaned across, I picked up her spoon, I opened up the pop, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, thing of peanut butter, scooped out the peanut butter, and then turned the spoon and gave it to her, you know, uh, handle first. And she picked up the, the, the peanut butter, uh, the spoon, and she, with her, her index finger of her left hand, holding back the tip of the spoon that was, had all kinds of peanut butter in it, um, she said, you know what I want to do? And I said, you want to flick that at me? She said, yeah. And I said, what will I do if you flick that at me? She said, you'll just get me another one. And I said, right, so it's up to you. And so she put it in her mouth and she ate, of course, begrudgingly. But I just talked to this patient. She's now 24. Um, and she sent me a picture of her, uh, of, her breakfast, of her dinner that she made. And it was wonderful. I had chicken and there was fat. There was all kinds of things involved. It looked very healthy, very well balanced. Um, and so I think the issue is that, you know, for this particular individual, this is where parents become very important in the recovery of patients with restrictive anorexic nervosa. The parents become the ones who make sure that the child gets what she or he needs to eat, just like I made sure that she got what she needed to eat while she was in the breakfast. The other patient observation, I did get the, uh, for reasons that I still don't understand, the Academy for Eating Disorders Leadership Award uh, for patient care, education, and advocacy. Um, and so I said, you know, I was given two minutes to make a presentation. Um, and so I, I kind of called patients and parents. I asked them, you know, I'm getting this award and I have two minutes to make comments. And I don't think I deserve the award, but, you know, if you, is there something that I did or didn't do uh, that you, you know, believe would, would be helpful in your recovery? And it was interesting because the patients I talked to, it's probably five or six of them. There was very, it was convergence on the concept of what they said was, you listen. And I kind of said, is that all I did? And I realized that what patients often don't get in treatment uh, was what they were getting in with for, for restrictive anorexia nervosa, especially with people weren't listening to them. They were telling them what to do, but they weren't listening. Uh, so I thought that was kind of a powerful thing from my, you know, as far as the patient observations. What about parent observations? Well, there was a dad who had five daughters, three of whom developed restrictive anorexia nervosa, who actually, he is actually the man who, who started the, the uh, helped us start the parent support group, Rochester Eating Disorder Support Group. Um, um, and actually we started that group back in February of 1990. Uh, and we were meeting once a month back then in person. Uh, and for the last two and a half years, we've met every Wednesday night um, on East Coast time from seven to eight on Zoom. And uh, so I'm gonna be meeting with a bunch of people tonight. Um, but the issue, parents and family members, loved ones, anyone who wants to be, who wants to check in on Zoom. But this father he had five daughters, three of whom developed anorexia nervosa, and it was the youngest daughter uh, when he finally came to an awareness, and that's why he wanted to have the support group. Um, and he was this wonderful man. He was Irish. He had a wonderful, not even Irish brogue, but he had a Buffalo, he had a Boston accent. He grew up in Boston. Uh, and he said, I finally realized having five daughters, three of whom developed anorexia nervosa, the youngest one, um, that God gave me two ears and one mouth. So I listened twice as much as I talked. And I think the biggest problem that I see for parents of young people who are recovering from anorexia nervosa is that they do way too much talking and not enough listening. Um, and I think that's an important kind of a message. Um, the other thing that there was a, a father at the support group who was talking to this father's daughter, Shannon, who was wonderful in helping with the support group. And uh, this other father was talking to um, uh, John, this father's uh, daughter, Shannon, Shannon, and said, Shannon, you know, my daughter thinks I'm yelling at her all the time. And, and, and this man, uh, John, you know, put his hand out to I kind of interrupt uh, this father talking to his daughter and saying, you know, I understand how you're feeling. Again, I've had five daughters, three of whom developed anorexia nervosa. And it's really important that for you to realize it doesn't matter what you think, 
if your daughter thinks you're yelling at her, you're yelling at her. And I think that was a really kind of an important point that patients who have restrictive anorexia nervosa are often very sensitive and any kind of a thing that would be considered a criticism uh, causes them to close down. Um, and so I think it's important to kind of, again, that's where the non-judgmental kind of a way can be really helpful. We also had two fathers. So I actually, when I started the support group, uh, it was interesting because, you know, moms and dads would come together. Uh, the problem is that dads wouldn't talk. Um, so I finally said, you know, we got to, the guys have to separate from the women. Um, and so we would have the moms and dads would come together. The moms would sit without anybody, you know, kind of moderating. I would go with the dads because he needed somebody to moderate them. Because if you get a bunch of dads sitting around, they're just going to sit and they're not going to talk to each other. So I was kind of the moderator. Uh, but it was real interesting that I had these meetings uh, for, we met for half an hour earlier. Um, so from 6.30 to 7, and then from 7 to 8, we, we uh, joined the, uh, the moms and other women. Uh, but we, had, we definitely segregated it by males and females uh, because males' approach to eating disorders tend to be very different uh, than, than, than females, especially dads and moms. Uh, so that there were two fathers. Uh, and the first one was he worked at the Genesee Brewery. So anybody who knows the Genesee uh, Brewery in, in Rochester, New York, it goes way, way back. He worked at the brewery. He was a factory worker. Uh, you know, he had, he had dirt under his fingernails when he came to these meetings. Uh, that's he worked in a factory. Uh, he was a Green Bay Packer fan. Uh, so we had this wonderful Green Bay Packer coat. Uh, that probably cost him, you know, a week's salary, uh, but a big green Green Bay pack, a big G on it, um, and he, a lunch pail, you know, the old time metal lunch pail. And when he came into the meeting, we sat around a table, you know, he threw the lunch pail down and he said, I don't understand this shit. Why doesn't she just eat? And all the dads, they were kind of nodding their heads. And about three months later, another dad came. He worked, he was a lawyer. He was actually, he worked in the um, in City Hall because he was a public defender. Uh, wore a three-piece suit, expensive, extensive, expensive suit, expensive shoes, and he carried a ostrich a leather um, uh, briefcase. And he came in and said, I have difficulty comprehending why she finds such, why she finds eating such a challenge. Two dads, both talking about different daughters, but it's the exact same kinds of a thing. And I think we have to understand that parents have difficulty and sometimes the dads have different difficulty than moms. And so I think we have to deal with both moms and dads. And so along these lines, I ask, when I, again, I ask patients, I get this Academy for Eating Disorders Leadership Award, you know, what did I do to help? And it was interesting that just like there was a consensus that you listen from the parents, from the patient, the consensus from the parents was you gave us hope. And again, I said, that all I did, but I realized that parents having hope is an essential part of, of, of the healing. Um, so those are parents' observations. But one thing that's a combination of a parent and, and, a, and, a, and a, uh, a patient kind of a thing uh, is lessons that I wish I knew uh, uh, from Tom Insel. So Tom Insel was the director of the National Institutes of Mental Health. Uh, this is his picture. Uh, and I feel, I mean, I feel like I've known Tom because Tom's brother, Dick Insel, uh, was a faculty member with me uh, at the University of Rochester. Um, and so, you know, I knew about the Insel family uh, from, from knowing Tom Insel's brother, Dick. Um, but Tom Insel also just wrote a book called Healing, Our Path from Mental Illness to Mental Health. At, he's no longer the director of the National Institutes of Mental Health. But it's real interesting because in this book, he tells two different stories the story of his daughter, Lara, who had anorexia nervosa, was treated and is now doing great. And another one, Amy, who didn't get the best kind of a treatment. Um, and I just think it's real interesting how he really kind of details, talks about other kind of mental illness issues, because again, the National Institutes of Mental Health is not just for children, but um, his focus on his daughter who had restrictive anorexia nervosa and contrasting it with another patient, Amy, um, I think has a lot of interesting kind of twist to it. But this was from a, um, a blog that um, uh, June Alexander uh, wrote. Uh, June Alexander is a wonderful colleague of mine who uh, is in Australia. Uh, she had anorexia nervosa herself as a, as a child, uh, developed it, and, and it was not until she was in her, I think her 
probably closer to 50 years of age when she realized she had an eating disorder and needed some treatment and she's doing great now. She actually is very much of a, uh, a representative on the Academy for Eating Disorders. But what, what Tom Insel, even though he's the director of the National Institute of Mental Health, he acknowledged that he was clueless as a parent. And that's one of the most important things. He said, I didn't know what to do. You know, I'm the director of the NIMH and I didn't know what to do as a parent. He also pointed out that language matters. And, you know, you probably listened, you know, heard me talking about language and now, you know, it's different between the patient lying versus the patient's not yet ready to tell the truth. Those are two very different things. And he said, we have to be very mindful of labels. And one of the problems that I have is labeling anorexia nervosa a psychiatric illness, a mental illness. Because I guess the way I look at it is when 95% of patients who develop restrictive anorexia nervosa are between the age of 12 and 20, and 90% of those are females dealing with issues of girl to woman, a child to adult, a childhood to adulthood, and what goes on in the brain. I have, I have trouble labeling that as a psychiatric illness. That's why I much prefer the term developmental illness. I actually did a TED talk uh, in framing it as a developmental illness, not to ignore depression, anxiety, it's obsessive compulsive trauma. Now, I don't want to ignore those issues. I just don't want to define people in those terms. And he said that insight is more important than weight or family history. Um, he also notes that eating disorders, they grow insidiously and slowly from one's own temperament, from one's temperament. And I think that's a thing I find much better. Temperament is a better label than a label of anxiety or depression, you know, something that is a is a, is a, a disorder, uh, your temperament. Um, and I get, and he says, it's best to identify and treat early. And I really believe that it's easier to identify and treat early if we don't frame it as a mental illness or a psychiatric illness. Um, I think people in pediatrics and, and family medicine are, are pretty much aware of, of these kinds of issues. And I think that uh, they can identify uh, you know, these things fairly early and not to wait till they get to a very, very uh, extreme level. He also points out these are family disorders, especially restrictive anorexia nervosa. Then they provide, and this is the point I really like about the way Tom thinks about things. It provides the context to the development of the eating disorder and resolution for it with a focus on expressing emotion. And I can imagine what it must be like being the head of the NIMH and your daughter has anorexia nervosa, you know, and you're the head of the NAMH and your daughter comes down with a condition that is under your, under your umbrella. I, I just thought that must have been fascinating kind of a situation for him, but uh, anybody who knows Tom, he's a very humble guy. And um, I think it was that, that ability. That's why I really like to acknowledge uh, this, um, this, this blog uh, that the, what causes you to have an eating disorder can also be used as the, uh, the issues of the resolution, but it needs, it requires expressing emotion. And, and, and this is, I think, another important point. That's why I like to talk about the, um, you know, the, the, the girl who drank the Diet Pepsi at age 14 and, and uh, you know, 16 years later is, is, uh, is uh, um, having a, a wonderful baby and a husband. Um, and what he says is that most go on to do spectacular things as adults using the very traits they may, may and take them into the eating disorder. I think that's the issue. How do we turn traits into assets rather than liabilities? Um, and again, rather than focusing on disorder, I like to focus on what's right with people. The other thing I think is really important also is the uh, important for, you know, to have somebody who can really follow things medically. Uh, one of the things that I've been struck by back in the day um, is I worked with a lot of wonderful social workers who would say, well, I'll weigh her in my, in my, in my clinic, in my, you know, when I see her in my office. Uh, and I say, I, I'd rather you didn't weigh her. Um, and here's why. Uh, this was a patient who had been hospitalized um, with restrictive anorexia nervosa. And after, one week after discharge, I was seeing her as an outpatient. She was 91 pounds. The urine specific gravity was normal. Her heart rate went from 62 to lying down to 70 standing. Her temperature was normal. Uh, and I saw her weekly visits, but by week five, her weight was the same, but her specific gravity was very low, which either her urine, she was unable to concentrate her urine or she was drinking so much water that her urine became very dilute. 
Also, the pulse went from 44 lying down up to 82 standing. That's a big pulse differential. Um, and her body temperature was low. Uh, that was a problem. And when I phys did a physical examination, um, I pressed on the on her, the right of her, the, the top of her foot. And about five seconds later, you can see it's still pale because the blood circulation had not come back in. A slow capillary refill. She also had, it doesn't show real well here, this is an old picture, but she had acrocyanosis, so the, 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 the feet uh, were kind of bluish. Um, and keratinemia, the tips of the toes were kind of carrot, had carotene, kind of an orange color. Um, so I said, okay, go back into the, into your, into the uh, treatment room and get back into a gown and come out. And I need to check looking at your back to make sure that, um, that, you know, there's nothing, no, no, uh, uh nothing uh, hidden, uh, to make you get heavier. Um, and her weight was up to 86 pounds, down to 86 pounds. So she was not 91 pounds, she was 86 pounds. She had lost five pounds. And so how from the beginning of the visit until I reweighed her, what happened? Well, when we went back to her room, here was a hair scrunchie that each time she got weighed, she would put a more, one more lock on the hair scrunchie, run it up her arm so that the scrunchie was on the top of her shoulder and the lock was in her armpit. So when we looked at the back of the, uh, the back of her uh, uh, the gown, you know, she didn't have a bra and there was no 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 underwear, no place that she could be hiding things. But this was what she was doing. She was holding, she was she was hiding weights. And this is why I think the weigh-in process needs to be done by somebody who can also do a physical examination. Uh, this is kind of a, a point that I think is really, and it just tells me how scared she was. And this young lady is now married has two wonderful kids and she is a psychiatric nurse, uh, but she's also maintaining a normal weight. But in when she was uh, a teenager, she really struggled. And I, I, I kind of want to you know, bring some time to make sure we have enough time for questions. This was a patient who was, uh, we had patients do a lot of artwork. Uh, so music therapy, art therapy, uh, lots of different kinds of things for patients who are in the adolescent uh, uh, inpatient unit on pediatrics. And as I walked out of her room, you know, this was something she had drawn. And I'm wondering, what do you see? She's obviously a very talented artist. And so when I walked into her room, this was the ceiling tile that was just uh, up overhead as I walked in. But when I walked out of her room, here's what I saw. It's the exact same picture, just rotated 180 degrees. And what she drew was, Obviously, here's an eyebrow, here's an eye, here's the mouth. This is the outline of the face. This is her nose and all these beautiful flowers. And you know what she talked about was what she was doing is she was feeding herself so she could blossom. And it's an interesting kind of a thing in my TED talk. I talk about a patient um, who I, um, you know, I, I said, you know, you, your body is like a plant. You know, you need, just like you feed a, a plant, you need to, you know, give it water, you give it food and things like that. You also need to give your body, um, um, uh, you know, feed your body. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I'm here to make sure that you feed your body. And without dropping a, a beat, she looked at me and she said, she's a 15-year-old girl, so what do you expect? So she says, yeah, and you're the fertilizer. I just love the fact that she considered me fertilizer for her recovery, and she is now doing very well as well, and actually is making use of her of her ability to in, in art. So I, I want to kind of bring this to an end. Um, this is from our Child and Adolescent Eating Disorder Program at the University of Rochester Medical Center, um, and um, uh, I really, you know, I, I want to thank you for your your attention. And again, I'd like to open it up now for. Um, any observations, questions, ideas, uh, whatever. So I will stop sharing at this point and we'll open um, it up. Um, so far I have two questions. Um, okay. First one is, um, can you share some strategies for engaging male loved ones? You know, you talked about how it's much harder. You put the dads in the room, they don't talk to each other. Um, do you have any strategies that you can suggest that would engage, um, you know, male partners, parents, other males in the life of someone with an eating disorder? 
Well, I, I, yeah, thank you. Very good question. I can tell you, I had a patient, a male patient who was in Syracuse, didn't do well in the program in Syracuse, came to Rochester. And I said to him, you've been in treatment now in two different places and it didn't work. I'm worried I will also not be of help to you. Tell me what I need to avoid so that I can help you. And without dropping a beat, he said, don't tell me how unusual it is for females to get anorexia nervosa. Uh, he said, I feel like a freak. And so I think the important thing is to realize that the, the experiences of females and males are very similar. Um, we also know that for some males, actually part of what they're dealing with is not just, a, not just around nutrition, there's also gender identity issues and sexual attraction issues. And the group that I'm finding very interesting, and I don't know what, I don't exactly know, I don't have the answer what we're gonna do for them, are those who are transgender. We have a very big gender health program in the Division of Adolescent Medicine at Galasano Children's Hospital. I mean, we have kids coming from all over the state and other states as well, and it's wonderful. But one of the problems is that when you have someone who was assigned female at birth um, and then go to, um, um, you know, and then transition to uh, male, whatever birth they're assigned, whatever gender they're assigned to birth, and then transition, it can be really difficult to figure out what it is. And that's why you just have to ask them. You need to kind of find out, okay, tell me what's going on for you as far as where you have struggles, what the difficulties are. Um, and so I think a thing that I have found useful is the issue is that many of the male patients I have, they're often interested in, you know, building muscle and things like that. And so I will talk to them, you know, you realize you're not gonna build muscle unless you give your body the nutrition you need in order to build that muscle. Uh, and I understand you're doing a lot of exercise and exercise is good, but you need to, div you need to make sure that you give your body the, the building blocks of those muscles. Um, so I, one, of the, one of the people I really like is a, a, a dietitian named Nancy Clark. Uh, and she's got a book called Nancy Clark's Sports Nutrition Guidebook. And it's got a whole section on eating disorders. And I really, I really like that. Um, I really like that, uh, um, that, that book. Um, the other thing is um, that I often find it useful to have a person, a, a male, if they are interested in physical um, um, experience, uh, if, they're, if they're interested in having any kind of physical symptoms, is to really kind of focus on what their symptoms are and then prescribe something that will address those physical symptoms. Um, so again, males and females um, are different, but they also share a lot of similar kinds of issues. But I think the issue is to ask, ask the, uh, um, ask the uh, individual uh, you know, where they are. Um, and kind of, again, that's where beginner's mind um, is real, real helpful. Um, next question. Um, we're very short on time, unfortunately, and there's a lot of questions. Um, so um, I'm going to ask, maybe you would be willing, um, if I sent you the questions on the chat that remain afterwards, if you'd be willing Absolutely. to perhaps answer them in writing, and then we can maybe post it, post it as a blog or get it to the participants so that everybody feels that their question is answered. Absolutely. Yeah, great, thank you. So um, someone asked, um, can you talk about your experience of comorbidities with ASD and disentangling what is the eating disorder and what is ASD? You mean autism spectrum disorder? Correct. Uh, I'm assuming that's ASD, autism spectrum disorder. I, I think that it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful question. And the, the thing where a, autism spectrum disorder comes in most clearly and with respect to the eating disorder are those who have ARFID, avoidant restricted food intake disorder because of the way they experience food and eating. Um, and so I think it's really important to understand that a lot of time when people have an eating disorder, it has nothing to do with wanting to lose weight, body image or anything like that. It has to do with the experience of eating and food. Um, and sometimes it's because they choked on something and they're afraid they're gonna choke again. Um, and so they end up with not being able to, uh, they don't eat enough to feed their body because they're afraid they're going to choke. Um, and so there's a lot of overlap between the autism spectrum disorder and various kinds of eating disorders, especially with respect to, uh, especially with respect to that diagnosis of ARFID. Good question. Great question. Um, okay. Another question is your thoughts on FBT. Probably have a lot of thoughts on FBT. Um, FBT, family-based therapy? Family-based treatment, exactly. Oh, well, 
Family-based therapy is the therapy which has the greatest uh, uh, evidence base to support it. Um, the key point is family-based therapy is not a mother and the child uh, involved in therapy. And the biggest problem that I have seen is in my practice is a mom and daughter who say he doesn't understand. Right, well, he's not gonna understand by excluding him from treatment. And I have had situations where I would say to the mom and kid, you know, you gotta bring your husband or your dad in here. I can't work, you know, he's part of this solution. And they would say, no, no, he's a, he thinks this is a bunch of crap. He thinks it's this, he's, he's too busy at work. And I, the, the lesson I learned was to actually say, what's better for me to call dad, call him at home or call him at work? And I would call him at, at work and he would say, who are you? My daughter seeing, I didn't know anything about this. And so dads are sometimes actively excluded. And I think we just have to actively include dads, but realize that a lot of blaming goes on in therapy and that does no one any good. Um, and so um, I, I think the issue of family-based therapy is the best way. It's got the evidence. It's the one that I work with because every parent, I, every person I've ever known know wants what's best for their child. Um, and uh, sometimes they don't know how to deal with it. And it's especially if they feel like they're blamed for it. Uh, so that's why I think the whole idea of parentectomy and those kinds of things. But family-based therapy is, is the, is, is the uh, uh, I think, the, the, the gold standard. And that's what we do in, so a kid comes into the hospital, like Alice Hunter Children's Hospital, we start family therapy the day the kid's admitted. Um, now, the treatment team is the one who kind of starts, okay, she's, this is what she has to eat, but we very quickly transfer the responsibility to parents. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I'm gonna put in one more question, even though we're really short on time. Um, do you have any advice about moving from parent-directed eating to more patient-directed eating for a 16-year-old? I guess the question is kind of like handing over the reins um, back to your child. I mean, look, you know, from personal experience, I can ask, how do you know you know, when to trust your child and how do you make that transition from the parent doing all the feeding to giving the control back to the child? Yeah, good question. And I, I asked that question of a dad and he said, tell everyone that recovery is a series of three steps forward and two steps backwards. And I think the most important thing you do is when you give the, 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 your son or daughter, you know, some opportunity to, to eat, you also have to give the opposite, uh, the issue of the opportunity to not eat. And then you have to step in. Uh, so you have to make sure that it's not, it's not an on-off switch. It's kind of a rheostat. So, okay, you're taking responsibility, but if you can't demonstrate that you can do what you need to do, then I'm stepping back in. Um, and so I think that it has to be something that the, the patient has to demonstrate that they can do what they need to do. Um, and that is a, that is a difficult, uh, um, which is a difficult question. Uh, but that's the, the main thing is, don't say, okay, it's, it's completely yours because they have to demonstrate they can do what they need to do. And, and that's actually a thing when I talk about kids who are in high school getting ready to go to college, what I say to the parents is, okay, she's gonna go off to college. I want you to treat her as if she's in college right now because if she can't show that she can eat when she's at home, she's gonna have a lot more difficulty eating at school. Um, and so we basically make the last three months of being at home before going off to college She's demonstrating what I'm going to do when I go to college. And that, that, that can be real helpful. These are all great, great questions. They are, and there are more. So I will be in touch with you with this list of questions. I'll be um, glad to answer, yeah, yeah. How you're going to answer them, thank you. So um, we've come to the end of our time. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Kripe, for joining us and for sharing your wisdom and your insight and your experience. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, those of you who are here today, um, all of these programs are free of charge, and the only way that we can continue keeping them free of charge and scaling them up to meet the matching need is by people donating. So um, if you like today's webinar and if you'd like to donate to Feast, we would really appreciate it. The link is here. Um, and please join us for our next webinar, which will take place on July 13th. Uh, we'll be Dr. Janet Tretch, sorry, Professor Janet Treasure who is gonna speak about skill sharing for supporters of people with eating disorders. Um, it's gonna take place at 1 p.m. Um, Eastern, 6 p.m. Um, London time, and it's gonna be a wonderful webinar. So again, thank you everyone. 
so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Kripe. Um, Have a great month, everyone, and we'll see you in July. And make sure you see the Janet, everything that I said, she, I got from her. <laughs>